Hi. I am so thrilled to see you all here tonight. This is awesome. I think this is a record um, for a, a Friday night uh, non-European, non-impressionist <laughs> lecture. So thank you. <laughs> Yay. Um, so it's really my great, great pleasure to introduce our final speaker uh, in the series that has been focusing on the special exhibition from the lands of Asia, the Sam and Myrna Myers collection. Um, this is another one of my longtime colleagues and friends. Um, I was trying to think, Keith, uh, when we met, and I think it was about 1990. I'm not sure. It was a, it was a while ago, but we're 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 still young and beautiful, right? <laughs> Um, so, J. Keith Wilson, who is the curator of ancient Chinese art at the Freer Gallery of Art and the Arthur M. Sacco Gallery in Washington, D.C. Keith received his B.A. in Chinese Studies from Williams College and completed his Ph.D. coursework at Princeton University after receiving M.A.s in Chinese Art and Archaeology from both the University of Michigan and Princeton. He was also a research fellow at the Institute of East Asian Studies at Tokyo University. And after serving as a Mellon Fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, he was appointed curator at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and that's when I first met him, and later the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And then in 2006, he joined the staff of the Freer Sackler. A specialist in Chinese antiquities, Keith recently completed the reinstallation of four galleries dedicated to early Chinese art in the Freer in 2017. And if you haven't been to the Freer Sackler in Washington, D.C., please go. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, at the same time, he opened the exhibition Resound, which explores ancient Chinese music with dozens of Bronze Age bells in the Sackler collection. Previously, he co-organized Echoes of the Past, the Buddhist Cave Temples of Xiang Tang Shan, a major traveling exhibition dedicated to late 6th century devotional sculpture in context. Keith has recently published the first volume of a digital catalog dedicated to the peerless collection of ancient jades in the Freer and Sackler, and I think later he's going to show you um, the link to the website for that. And he's working on a second volume which features 225 early Bronze Age examples, which will appear this spring. From its origins in the Stone Age, jade working represents the oldest and longest continuous artistic tradition in China. For the first 3,000 years of Chinese civilization, spanning the late Neolithic period and the Bronze Age, jades were symbols of status and power among the social and political elite, and some jades also served as magical accessories for rites and rituals. In both capacities, they almost always accompanied their owners to their graves. Keith's lecture tonight addresses the lifespan of early Chinese jade objects from their fabrication to their burial, focusing on examples in the Sam and Myrna Myers collection. So please join me in welcoming Keith Wilson. Thank you very much, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for coming out on a beautiful Friday evening. We would not get an audience like this in Washington, D.C. if the weather was like this, let me tell you. <laughs> Published some 2,000 years ago, the earliest Chinese dictionary defines jade poetically as the fairest of stones. And I've circled it there at the top of the right-hand column for you. That early de description is supplemented by an additional 126 terms that describe the characteristics of jade, its sources, colors, and distinct levels of quality. The same dictionary includes a secondary cluster of terms that relate to all other kinds of stones their features, and their qualitative distinctions between jade and all other rocks. 
Clearly, jade was an important material in ancient China and treated differently from all other kinds of stone. The current exhibition of the Sam and Myrna Myers collection, so rich in early Chinese jades, offers a perfect opportunity to explore traditional Chinese attitudes <clears throat> towards the material and recognize how geology and archaeology have contributed to our understanding, our modern understanding. In this talk tonight, I plan to outline the lifespan of a piece of jade, from its discovery as an unworked pebble to a finished object made by knowledgeable craftsmen that appreciated the qualities of their stone and made an object that would be loved by a discerning consumer, someone who might enjoy it so much during their own lifetime that they decided to take it with them to the grave. A range of fine stones were systematically selected to make special objects that are found in Chinese stone and Bronze Age burials. Although an ancient Chinese patron may have considered all of these, all five of these tablets, which are essentially abstract symbols of deceased ancestors, to be jade, modern geologists would draw distinctions between them, labeling different materials with names like nephrite, fluorite, and turquoise. And so even though we're looking at a very similar form and they're all ancestor effigies, you have a couple of examples made of jade, a fluorite example, and then a turquoise piece. To ancient Chinese eyes, all of these would have fallen within the rubric of the term jade. Despite the geological imprecision of the basic Chinese word and its definition, almost all quote-unquote jade objects found in ancient Chinese tombs and habitation sites were actually made from nephrite. So even though we're looking at different materials here, in a typical Chinese burial, the lion's share of objects would be made out of nephrite, which is a fine-grained, compact, amphibole type of mineral. This is truly amazing since it suggests an almost scientific ability to recognize a distinct stone type long before the advent of geology some 5,000 years ago. We'll be concentrating on nephrite tonight, but as many of you know, nephrite is often linked with jadeite. Uh, and here I'm showing you a nephrite example on the left and a jadeite example on the right. Uh, that kind of bright apple green stone known as jadeite is what one frequently encounters in modern Chinese jewelry stores, but it's totally absent from the Chinese archeological um, um, roster in, in ancient China. So we're really concentrating on nephrite. Um, we really don't know how ancient Chinese consistently identified nephrite in nature, but it's safe to say that surface color alone would not have been a very useful guide. Uh, and all of the pieces on the screen now are nephrite. Um, nephrite occurs in a range of colors depending upon embedded elements that are within the stone, like iron, manganese, and chromium. These elements create samples that can be yellowish, greenish, brownish, or blackish. In addition, sources in nature are typically encased in a weathered skin that hides the true color of the stone within, so they would have had very few um, pieces of evidence to go on in selecting the stone in nature. With consistent access to relatively homogeneous sources, finished objects of one period or one region may be exemplified by one color or another, however. Uh, and I'm giving you a couple of examples here. The dark, highly figured stones on the right, nephrite, is closely associated with the Northwest late Neolithic Chijia culture, 
It's characteristic of many of the objects they make. Well, the almost pure white nephrite that's illustrated here on the left was a type of stone that typically was reserved for the finest imperial works of the Han Dynasty some 2,000 years later. So even though we have this range of color, there seems to be some associations between um, certain colors and certain types, certain time periods, certain regions. Um, this probably is because the craftsmen are using local sources. It's worth noting, however, that across time and geography, the finest jewelry is typically made from light green or yellow nephrite, suggesting that this material was reserved to ornament the body. And here we're looking at um, four different bracelets um, from a range of Neolithic cultures. Ancient prospectors, craftsmen, and connoisseurs must have recognized properties beyond color that characterized the special stone they valued. These may be the same as the qualities identified by modern geologists and other scientists who have developed a variety of tools to sort, analyze, and label their stone samples. One of the first such techniques to emerge in the early 19th century AD was a scale of hardness that was developed by the German mineralogist Frederick Mose in 1812. And here we're looking at a sample Mose kit. Uh, you can buy this online. Uh, the Mose scale consists of minerals of increasing hardness with values ranging from one, the softest, which is talc, to 10, the hardest, which is diamond. In between are gypsum, calcite, and a range of other minerals. I've indicated here on the screen that nephrite falls between feldspar and quartz. These hardnesses are determined with a test kit uh, with sharpened points of each of the materials. And here you can, oops. Here are the 10 different samples. And then here are your testing kits. What you can do is um, load up a sample of the mineral in your probe and then try to scratch the surface of a mineral. The hardness, the hardness of um, the mineral will be determined once you get to the point where um, you're actually scratching a mineral surface. For instance, nephrite has a Mohs hardness of six to six and a half, meaning that it cannot be scratched by minerals like gypsum or fluorite, but it can be marked by quartz or corundum. So this is a way of actually assessing the hardness of any material in nature. Better insight into the material comes at a microscopic level. And here we're looking at a thin section image of a tiny nephrite sample viewed through a petrographic microscope. Now this, of course, was not available in Stone Age times. The image may seem a little blurry, but that's because the nephrite fibers are so small and tufted that it's impossible to get a sharp focus. A thin section is 30 micron, uh, microns thick. So if you think about it, we're actually looking through a stack of nephrite fibers here. This fine and felted structure gives nephrite its toughness and its ability to take a high surface polish. These properties, in addition to its range of attractive colors, are probably precisely the qualities that have endeared the material to China since the Stone Age. Unfortunately, the felted crystals characteristic of nephrite also make it very brittle and easily broken. Given the value of the material, however, fragments were often retained or used to make new forms and were very rarely discarded. An understanding of the geological sources of the raw nephrite material exploited by early Chinese cultures is still developing. And here I'm showing uh, a range of actually sites where Neolithic jades have been discovered. 
um, Neolithic period being roughly a span between the mid fourth millennium BC, around 3,500 BCE, to uh, around the year 2000 BCE. It's thought that many supplies may have been depleted in antiquity since obviously jade using cultures are appearing across the entire Chinese countryside. And because nephrite tends to occur in small localized deposits, they may well have been tapped out already by the Neolithic period. Research into nephrite occurrence in China and neighboring regions is currently underway. At this point, findings are only preliminary and conclusions are very tentative. It appears, however, that nephrite deposits may have existed in many regions of China in ancient times that would have supported jade use at all of these different cultures and sites uh, across um, ancient China. To introduce the occurrence of nephrite in nature, since I can't point to a Chinese example to share with you tonight, it may be useful to look to Canada, where significant nephrite deposits still exist in the landscape. As may have been the case in China, the tough nephrite stone is naturally embedded in other rocks, such as limestone. Since limestone, with a hardness value falling between three and four, is much softer than nephrite, natural erosion of this matrix exposes nephrite in the landscape over time. When completely loosened from the softer surrounding rock, and here's a huge nephrite boulder, and another large one there. When completely loosened from the softer surrounding rock, nephrite boulders like these are free to tumble down mountainsides. This explains why traditional literary accounts in China often report nephrite being found in river or stream beds. They originally had been embedded in mountainsides. The matrix of the landscape eroded with time, freeing the harder nephrite to tumble down the mountainside and end up in riverbeds. In this slide, we can see two huge nephrite boulders in natural settings in the countryside of British Columbia. The image of the slice boulder at Cucho Creek in the upper right shows that weathered skin I mentioned earlier that naturally develops to coat the stone and hide the dark green fabric within. Now, I'd like to turn to the techniques used to convert such boulders or pebbles into finished objects. It's important first to remember that nephrite is very hard. In fact, it's harder than iron or steel, meaning that it cannot be cut or even scratched with a steel blade. Thus, it must be shaped with techniques using materials that are harder than it. And so here on our Mohs scale, it means that you would be using materials like quartz, topaz, corundum, or diamonds to actually um, abrade the surface away. And I'll be talking in some detail about that in just a second. Chinese archaeologists have yet to discover and document an ancient Chinese workshop, sadly. Thus, an understanding of fabrication and finishing techniques must be based upon a careful e examination of surviving artifacts themselves and suppositions based on time-honored techniques still in use in traditional jade workshops in the modern period. To illustrate the process, I'll be drawing on a study undertaken by Howard Hansford, who documented a Beijing workshop in 1939. Um, they were not using electricity in the workshop at the time, so it gives us a little bit more of a direct connection to Neolithic approaches <laughs> before the advent of electricity, of course. The challenges that faced those craftsmen in 1939 were essentially the same ones that confronted ancient workers thousands of years before. Jade objects were typically crafted through a series of shaping, embellishing, and finishing phases that require hard abrasives, as we've just discovered, like quartz, corundum, or garnet. These abrasives are used to abrade, not cut, the nephrite surface. And this is the first of Hansford's images in 1939. In this image, 
An abrasive is being ground to a fine sand in a milling operation. The donkey is attached to a milling wheel and it's pulling this presumably granite grinder around and crushing the abrasive which is on top of the millstone. The resulting material is key to each step of the fabrication process, as we'll see. Large blocks, like those we saw um, in the Canadian countryside, would have been cut using a, straw li a saw like this. Um, Hansford describes the saw as follows. The saw, which, here's the saw. The saw, which consists of a strand of wire in tension between two ends of a bamboo frame, is held by two apprentices who pull it backwards and forwards across a block of stone, which is here in the middle, while a man holding a ladle between them keeps the cut wetted with a mixture of abrasives and water. The mixture flows into a bowl below and is used repeatedly until the abrasive becomes too finely pulverized to be useful. A boulder of this size being cut in this fashion would have taken about mm, nearly a month to cut in half. The back and forth movement of the flexible saws like this sometimes left circular slice marks that are still visible on ancient stone surfaces. Here, the outer skin of the rock is being removed, and the object is being roughly shaped using a disc and abrasive. So this gentleman is holding the disc, and here you see it anchored in a work table. Um, strings are attached to the spindle of the disc that are attached to foot pedals, and so the craftsman is actually rotating the blade by pumping his feet. The operator is holding the pebble in his right hand against the lower edge of the rotating disc and is about to apply a handful of abrasive to the edge a little bit higher up. As he rotates the disc using his foot treadles, the abrasive will be carried into the cut and will slowly bite its way through the jade. Any irregularities or sharp edges are removed using a grinding wheel. As in the previous slide, the jade is held in the worker's right hand and the wet abrasive, which is seen in a heap on his work table, is applied with his left hand. The bamboo shield over the grinding wheel is to protect the operator's eyes from any flying fragments of jade or sand. Holes are made with hollow drills, as seen here. And here actually is the drill. The drill tube is kept filled with wet abrasive and is rotated by a bow, the string of which is passing around the tube. It's worked to and fro by a young boy. So by moving this bow back and forth, it rotates the drill, and it's drilling into the jadeite sample, uh, nephrite sample, which is right here below the drill. Lastly, surfaces would have been polished. For these final stages, the tools were smeared before use with a paste made of polishing medium so that both hands of the craftsman are free to manipulate the jade. At the very end, a series of le le leather buffing wheels would have been held against the surface. Understanding the physical properties of nephrite and the standard workshop practices developed in China helped to explain many of the qualities that are consistently observed in finished objects like those on view in the gallery upstairs. <laughs>
first comes the recognition that the natural boulder or pebble can most easily be converted into the largest number of objects if it is initially cut into a series of slices, just like a loaf of bread. This explains why so many jades are thin and flat. Most of them, especially the early examples, with smooth surfaces that are generally parallel to one another. Second, surfaces with relief decoration, like both of these examples, are much more difficult to create than smooth, flat surfaces. And beveling, like we're seeing here, would have been a very time-consuming process. By beveling, I mean you don't have a smooth surface, but you have rounded edges and rounded relief elements placed all over the surface. Third, straight edges like those on the left would have been easier to produce than curves, especially irregular curves. Last, round holes like that we're seeing on the left and round objects, in addition, would have been easier to make than pieces with irregular open work like that, on th the piece on the right. To create those irregular openings, the craftsman would have made um, a repeated series of round drill holes and then basically cut between those holes to free these irregular surfaces and define the inner contours of the piece. It's much easier for round holes, you only have to drill it once. For any one of these irregular pieces, they might have been drilled as many as six or 12 times. These observations provide the basis for a kind of rudimentary art history that essentially evolves from squared or rounded objects with smooth, flat surfaces or round holes, like those on the left, to more complex shapes and surfaces featuring irregular openwork. These developments also suggest the use of progressively finer tools that could have been used to direct the power of more effective abrasives more precisely against the nephrite surface. So whereas the Neolithic craftsmen may have been using essentially bone or wooden tools, the late Bronze Age craftsmen who had been who would be producing something like these objects on the right could well have been using more finely pointed metal tools. As we know, the metal tool itself cannot mark the jade surface, but at least it could have been used to more um, effectively target the abrasive to the desired areas of the stone surface. It's also useful to note that it is extremely wasteful and very difficult to create vessels from nephrite which is why they are very rarely found in ancient China. And here we're looking at an amazing nephrite cup and a crystal cup that are included in the exhibition upstairs. These are truly remarkable. As you can see again from this shot from 1939 in Howard Hansford's study, the way that you create a cavity is basically to create, basically by um, 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 creating a series of parallel uh, saw marks into a um, thick piece of jade, uh, removing a, making it uh, con concave. Let's amplify this rudimentary art history with information provided by archaeology. To simplify matters, I'd like to introduce three different burials which roughly span the chronological range of the objects on display in the Myers show upstairs. The three tombs also represent different regions, with one each in southeast, central, and north China. Discovered over a seven-year period from 1976 to 1983, these three burials together provide enormous insight into jade use and style in ancient times. Let's begin with the rich burial of an unknown Stone Age chieftain in Sidun, Jiangsu province. This tomb is located in the region of Lake Tai, which was the center of a major jade-using culture named Liangzhu. 
This culture flourished 5,000 years ago, roughly between the years of 3300 BCE and 2250 BCE. The Liangzhu did not have a system of writing. They are Stone Age people. So we have no records to reveal their historic events, religious beliefs, or social order. We can only make suppositions and surmises based on the objects that they left behind, um, such as tombs like this. In elite Liangzhu tombs, objects were sometimes arranged as they are here protectively around the deceased. And there are remains of a body essentially inside the surrounding circle of various types of jades. The placement of jewelry in this tomb suggests that bracelets and pendants and head ornaments were worn at the time of burial. Aside from a, these few pieces of jewelry, the burial, which contains the body of a male, is dominated by large discs and long square tubes. Obviously, you can pick out the discs for yourself. Here are the long tubes. I'll be talking in a second about some of these axe blades. It's difficult to know the purpose of these objects, which may be a Liangzhu culture innovation. Obviously, they are much too large to be worn. It's also impossible to determine if they had any function during the lifetime of the deceased. So it's presumed that they may have been solely made for burial. Given their number and scale and the resources that went into their shaping, they represent great material and social value in its time. We may be on somewhat firmer ground when trying to understand a fourth object type that was included in the Sudun burial, as I mentioned, the jade blades. Given the brittle nature of nephrite, these axes could not have been produced as functional tools, but instead uh, must be seen as symbolic, possibly like regalia, Rep representing signs of power and authority. And I think you recognize this person um, holding some of the symbols of rank um, of the royal family of the United Kingdom. Uh, I also like to remind students that the ancient Chinese pictograph for the term father actually shows a human hand raising an ax. So possibly these symbolic axes conveyed a similar sense of authority on a broader social level in ancient times. This repertoire, jewelry, discs, tubes, and axes, is consistent among elite Liangzhu culture burials that span over a thousand years and are spread across a vast area between modern Shanghai Nanjing and Hangzhou, if you have a mental map of China in your mind, that's basically the south of the Yangtze River, uh, covering an area that now is uh, divided between three different provinces. This clearly must be viewed as China's richest ancient jade using culture. In fact, in June 2006, very recently, Archaeologists working near Hangzhou began to unearth the largest and earliest walled city in ancient China. Located south of the Yangtze River, the, the enormous settlement that it enclosed included palace foundations, royal tombs, craft workshops that formed the center of life and death of the Liangzhu culture. It appears now that the great wealth of this Neolithic culture was based upon tremendous advances in agriculture, which facilitated urbanization and a specialization of labor, supporting the expansion of jade production, as we've just seen. Let's now turn to our second burial, which dates to the early Bronze Age, roughly a thousand years after the latest Liangzhu objects that we were just looking at. This richly furnished tomb was created for a late Shang Dynasty royal consort who lived in the early Anyang period and probably died around the year 1200 BCE. So it's a much deeper pit burial than we were looking at before. There's a raised 
contour around the edges, and we're looking at masses of enormous bronze ritual vessels. So that is one indicator that we've passed into the Bronze Age now. The body itself was located presumably here in the center of the tomb. The red that we're looking at on the ground here um, is the remains of cinnabar, which is often used to um, coat the area that the body would have been placed in. And what you can't quite see is that all of this material on top of the cinnabar um, are jades. This consort and her tomb were located in the late Shang Dynasty capital in northern uh, Hunan province, about 300 miles south of modern Beijing. So we've moved north of Jiangzi almost all the way up to, to Beijing. This consort named Fu Hao is an historic figure, unlike our unnamed Neolithic chieftain. Her name also appears frequently in the inscribed oracle bones that were found at Anyang, the late Shang capital, which record the major events of the ruling elite of the time. In addition to a massive number of ritual bronze vessels, she was buried with over 750 jade objects, nearly all of them made from nephrite. Although a few discs and tubes were included in the burial, they were clearly not as important as the regalia and jewelry. This shift in tomb contents relates less to the gender of the buried, uh, the tomb occupant, and more to changes in taste and ritual. With the Neolithic preference for jades made primarily for burial, replaced by types that can be worn or displayed in life. Here, instead of the earlier stone axes that we were looking at, we're now looking at um, stone halberd blades. These are derived from a, a Bronze Age weapon, uh, not unlike a sword. They were made to be hafted, that is, attached to a handle and swung in battle. Uh, so that's why they often have holes that would have allowed them to be tied to a handle. The handles were typically made out, made out of wood, perishable, and so they no longer survive. All we have are the more durable elements, the stone blades and the metal fittings. But at least it indicates a continuation of this preference for regalia, uh, this time transferred into a new Bronze Age weapon type. And I'm also showing you some of her pendants. Remarkably, Fu Hao's tomb also contained a number of Neolithic jades of various dates and cultures, suggesting that she must have been a jade collector. These were not properly identified in the initial excavation monograph where all of the pieces were thought to date from the same age as the burial itself, that is, the early Anyang period. It took several um, years for scholars to catalog them correctly as heirlooms, predating the Shang Dynasty by one or even 2,000 years. The same tomb, and that's what we're looking at here on the left of the slide, these are associated with the Neolithic Hungshan culture and date several thousand years before the tomb in which they were found in. So, they were heirlooms that she was able to somehow um, gain possession of. The same tomb also included a group of jades with um, Shang-style decoration and working methods applied to shapes that were inspired by much earlier Neolithic models, like the piece on the right here. Um, circular pendants in the form of coiled dragons show a familiarity with Neolithic works created by the Hongshan culture again predating the early Anyang period by nearly 2,000 years. The inclusion of truly ancient objects, as well as archaizing examples inspired by ancient models, suggests that not all jades were buried shortly after they were first made, never to be seen again. Instead, some may have been treasured above ground and passed from one generation to the next for long periods of time throughout antiquity. Alternatively, they could have been found by chance discoveries in ancient times and returned to active use um, at that point. 
Now I'd like to look at the last of our series of three examples. This is the tomb of the king of Nanyue, and now we've moved all the way down to South China, Guangzhou or Canton, you may know it. Um, this too is the burial of an historic figure, Zhao Mo. He was the second king of Nanyue, which was a kingdom that included parts of southern China as well as northern Vietnam. He reigned um, over the kingdom of Nanyue from 137 BCE to 122 BCE. So we've moved basically another millennium, another thousand years um, from the Fu Hao tomb um, to more recent times. The burial uh, was much more complex in design than the, the massive pit burial we were just looking at with the consort Fu Hao tomb. This is designed more like a conceptual underground palace. It's entered through a long sloping ramp. And sorry, I, there, this tomb has not been very well published in excavation photos, so it's, it's actually easier to look at the the, to, the reconstruction of the tomb plan, but this is um, an attempt to, to portray what the tomb looked like when the, uh, it was under archeological excavation. So it's entered through a long sloping ramp to the tomb entrance, which were um, stone doors. There are antechambers on either side before you get to the heart of the tomb. The main coffin chamber is in the center and there are a number of surrounding halls that contained a range of objects. Um, actually, over a thousand pieces were buried in this tomb. It included gold and silver vessels and seals, as well as musical instruments like ancient Chinese bronze bells. Um, it's noteworthy that it also included imported non-Chinese items, which shows that we've moved to a period when there is um, larger interaction between um, the Chinese heartland and surrounding cultures and peoples outside of the main Sinitic center. Most important for us is this was a jade suit burial. And here we're looking at the reconstruction of the suit. Um, of course, with the, the decomposition of the body, the suit collapsed. Um, and so this is a, a reconstruction uh, it's interesting that the reconstruction includes all 2,291 small jade rectangular tiles. These tiles were all um, perforated or drilled in the corners, the four corners, and then tied together. Unlike the example that's on display upstairs and most of the other jade suits that have been found in Western um, Han tombs, this one, uh, coming from the south, is not um, sewn together using metal thread, but it actually uh, was sewn together using silk thread. So it shows a kind of regional variation in the, in the approach. Um, jade burial suits um, appear to be a practice that is restricted to the Han Dynasty, especially the early Han Dynasty, and is most closely associated with um, the royal family uh, of the, of the Han Dynasty. Here we're looking at a kind of local potentate in South China, and he's emulating this um, imperial practice. Um, conceptually, uh, drawing jade this close to the body is somewhat reminiscent of what we saw with the burial of the unnamed Liangju chieftain several thousand years earlier where the body was surrounded by jade objects almost in a kind of protective way. And I think there is a kind of conceptual connection here. Um, I think this approach and this um, belief in the protective qualities of jade, especially in burial, um, relates to a kind of revival of those earlier Neolithic practices. It's interesting to note too, it's hard probably to see from where you're sitting, but the, the burial also included a large number of discs, again like the Sudun burial and other Liangju burials that were placed in close association with the body and the jade suit. Um, this revival of the use of large numbers of jade discs um, also seems to be directly related to um, 
Stone Age burial practices. So it's thought, in fact, uh, we're in South China again here, it's thought that the chance discovery of some of those prehistoric um, Liangju tombs may have inspired new burial practices and new approaches to outfitting tombs in the late Bronze Age and early Imperial period as evidenced by the tomb of the King of Nanyue. Uh, here's an example of one of those um, Han discs. Unlike the early Stone Age ones that we were looking at earlier, this one is decorated. The Liangju examples are almost completely undecorated, just flat, flat discs. Um, also, um, we can see the incorporation of um, the disc form in jewelry, like this amazing pectoral that was worn by the deceased in the tomb. To sum up and to bring this um, sequence to a close, uh, to allow time for questions and discussion. Um, the tradition that we've been talking about um, this evening is one massive long chapter in the use, um, and, uh, the use of jade, uh, the creation of jade forms and the practice of incorporating them um, both in life but more obviously in death um, through burial. Um, this tradition basically comes to a close in the early Han period, the early imperial period, um, when the revivals, like we were just looking at with the King of Nanyue, um, mark a kind of glorious end to traditions that started thousands of years earlier. Um, in the later Han, and then continuing for the next 2,000 years through imperial Chinese history, Jade is used less and less for ritual forms and more and more for decorative purposes and jewelry. And I think that's what we're looking at in these later pieces that are on display upstairs in the galleries. Um, in this uh, later, more decorative chapter, we see a very different interest, uh, a more sculptural interest in using the stone and uh, a more complex, uh, rounded surface. Than, uh, that was made possible by probably technical advances in the jade workshops of the imperial period. Um, maybe I'll end there, uh, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And I guess uh, if you want to raise your hand, if you have a question, we have some people who can get you a microphone so everyone can hear the question that you want to ask. Oh, there's a gentleman. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I just wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more fully about how those discs were sliced. They're so perfect. Um, if they must have been held um, in, in place in a, in a, with a, a vice-like apparatus in, uh, in antiquity. Uh, because, yeah, if you're making one slice that takes you basically a month to cut through, the jade can't move. Um, and you, you want the, your um, source material to be completely stationary. Um, other than that, I, I really don't know. Um, we have, uh, in a couple of instances, maybe let me flash back to two pieces in the Freer and Sackler collection. These two discs uh, on the right are actually in our collection. Um, one is in the Freer, one is in the Sackler. They had very different modern histories. Uh, but what's interesting is, look at the, the veining of the surface of the two discs. Um, they must have come from the same jade boulder. Um, and given their relative size, they look like they might be one slice apart. If you think of sort of an Italian loaf of bread that has thicker slices towards the middle and thinner slices towards the edge. Um, I think what we're looking at here is basically the, the size of the jade boulder that they would have been cut from. And yeah, the, the slices are fairly evenly thick. 
the two of them, but not completely the same thickness. Um, in each case, they're a little bit thicker towards one end or the other, and um, the surfaces are not completely parallel. So whatever means must have been used to, to hold the mineral in place as it was being sliced in antiquity, there was some movement in the saw, there was movement in the stone, uh, and so yeah, they're, they're not as precise as they appear maybe on the screen. Uh, if you look at the pieces upstairs, uh, make a point of looking at them from the side too to see if there's a kind of unevenness in the thickness of those pieces. Yeah. Oh, just one second. There's someone here. Thank you. Uh, was this just labor, or it had something in religion? Like if you're sewing for one hour, it's as meditative as it can be. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the. Uh, was it meditation when they were cutting it, or it was just labor? When they're doing it for one one hour, they're cu for one week they're cutting. When they're sewing the. Oh, oh! The question is: um, Is the the sawing of the is essentially all of this repetitive labor that's involved in forming an object in an ancient or even in a in a modern workshop um, meditative, or is it just labor? Um, I'm guessing that it's just labor. There's a gentleman here. Sir, um, what was the material used for the abrasive and the blade on the saw? And was the blade designed in any particular way to improve the use of the abrasive? Um, great. Uh, let me go to that sewing picture. In this workshop in 1939, Hansford says that the... Um, the saw is actually a, a single wire from the two ends of the bamboo frame. Um, in ancient times, of course, there, there probably wasn't um, wire involved. It may well have been a leather strap saw. Um, wire, of course, is more efficient. It would have lasted longer than a leather strap. Um, but in Neolithic times, they didn't have wire to use. Um, I, um, the um, abrasive that was used in um, this workshop was generally corundum, uh, but in ancient times it's thought that um, the abrasive was probably garnet um, or maybe corundum as well because there, there have been some corundum blades that have, have been found uh, in, in Chinese tombs uh, of the Stone Age period. Um, so it's a, we're, it's a little hypothetical for um, the, bronze, uh, the, the stone and bronze age period, but um, it would have been a local abrasive, and there are Chinese sources for corundum and garnet, um, probably not diamond. Uh, there, there's um, no evidence for use of um, diamond in, in sawing. Uh, in terms of how the, the blade might have um, directed the abrasive against the, um, the stone surface, um, if we're dealing with um, the Stone Age, um, it just would have been the pressure of the material. And of course, if it's leather, it would have um, had to be replaced uh, repeatedly, um, very frequently, very, very frequently. Um, likewise, um, when we're talking about um, the drill bits. Um, here we're looking at um, a sheet metal uh, tubular drill. Um, in the Stone Age, again, we w they wouldn't have been using um, metal drills that may well have been sections of bamboo or some other kind of hollow material. Um, the bamboo would have very quickly uh, abraded away uh, because it, of course, is even softer than the stone surface. Um, so again, um, these uh, tools that would have been used in Stone Age times would have um, needed to be replaced um, repeatedly, which is probably another reason why it took them 
so long to cut through or drill through any of their, their stone samples. Is there a person here? These objects were so beautiful. They were used for burials. They were so important in the culture. In ancient Chinese writings, do you ever read about them? Do they talk about the jade, the jade maker? The, do we ever hear about them? Um, I'm, the, it's a workshop tradition. Um, like many of the creative industries um, in ancient China, it's an anonymous tradition, and it would have involved just like this 1939 workshop where we see different people performing different parts of the fabrication process. Uh, in the Stone Age and in the Bronze Age, um, teams of workers would have been involved. Um, they're nameless to us, um, and there's no attention paid for them in the historical record in um, the Bronze Age and early imperial period, so we, we don't know anything about them. Um, as craftsmen, uh, compared to craftsmen who are in other industries like um, ceramicists and um, bronze uh, foundry workers, they were probably of a middle class status in ancient culture, so they may well have had um, a beautiful pit home instead of living on uh, above ground. Um, they probably were um, passing their trade down from one generation to the next. It would have been uh, probably uh, a position of some status in the society. So even though their names are, are unknown to us, uh, it doesn't mean that they would have been uh, low-class people at the time. In the Myers collection, among the lighter jade pieces, there are quite a number of dragons and tigers and a number of rather interesting composite animals. Right. Can you talk a bit about the iconography that evolved as these pieces uh, became more complex? Um, the, the question of composite animals is a really interesting one. Uh, if you think of the mythological animals that appear um, earlier in Chinese history, Stone Age or um, early Bronze Age, um, the mythical creatures are, are purely mythical. I mean, there's, there's nothing that uh, typically allows you to connect them with any kind of living creature. When you get to the late Bronze Age and early Imperial period, like the later jades you're mentioning upstairs, um, there's a very different approach to mythological animals, and they become uh, more composite in character, where you can see, oh, that looks like um, the snout of a tiger, or those are the horns from a reptile. Um, this seems to suggest uh, a new approach to creating supernatural creatures, and this idea of the composite is something that is not... Um, domestically inspired. There's not a Chinese tradition for creating um, mythological creatures as composites. It probably is an idea that is introduced from outside China. And it's during the 5th, 4th, 3rd century BCE when a number of ideas are just beginning to reach China from the northwest, from the steppe lands. And there's a much richer tradition of creating mythological or supernatural beings there as composites. So I think that's what we're seeing reflected, not in this kind of nomad style, it's, it's reflected in a really beautiful, refined Chinese manner, but the concept, I think, is coming from outside. Yeah. You always hear so much about uh, Chinese jade. What about other Asian cultures? Uh, is there any evidence that uh, they used uh, jade in uh, their ceremonies or their, uh, uh, their, their decorations? And also, was jade ever used as a trading medium uh, among the Chinese and other uh, cultures that came through there? Um, in terms of jade-using cultures, 
uh, in antiquity. Um, there are a number of Stone Age cultures spread throughout China that used jade, but in very different manners. So even though currently those cultures are contained within the boundaries of modern China, um, they were probably ethnically divergent uh, and may actually have been using the stone um, to create objects of, of different, uh, for different purposes. Uh, I think there is um, a sharp distinction we can make between the cluster of Chinese, especially Stone Age cultures, um, and a little bit further to the north and west. Um, so essentially, um, the Siberia, northern Korea, uh, and into Japan, where there um, is also strong evidence of very early use of jade. And uh, the nef it's, again, nephrite. Um, it's characteristically um, color-wise, uh, uh, elementally, different from a lot of the stones that are used um, in China proper. And the object um, uh, vocabulary, the, the kinds of shapes and, and um, objects that are being made in this area, in Mongolia, Siberia, Northern Korea, and then on to Japan. Um, seems to re reflect um, a, a local use. Uh, it doesn't persist and become as kind of emblematic of those Northeast Asian cultures as Jay does in China. Um, but there is evidence for this, you know, kind of parallel adaptation. Uh, it does continue um, in some ways within the shamanistic traditions of the steppe. Uh, and in some cases, they were using um, old objects. They were using antiques, that, and recycling antiques as part of shamanistic practices in Mongolia and, and southern Siberia. Uh, but I think that is the one case where we can say that, you know, kind of a very different use of, uh, of jade is occurring in East Asia, but uh, it, it, it's kind of different from the Chinese case. I hope that helps. Uh, Jennifer is telling me we have time for one last question. I, yeah. I want to go back to the uh, disc. I was, you talked about the quality of the thickness. It appears in the pictures that uh, they are almost perfect circles. Do you have any idea of why or how they got the circles to be so perfect? And is there a purpose for the hole in the middle? Thank you. Yeah, that, that was something that I meant to mention in, as part of the body of the talk. And I'll get back to your question about the exchange medium, because they're kind of related to one another. Um, one thing that Hansford does not observe in the Beijing workshop in 1939 is the use of um, lathes, basically. Uh, and I think um, that uh, the perfect circular perimeter of a number of disks and the presence of a round hole essentially in the center of the disk can possibly also be explained in, in a kind of... Um, functional manner, uh, that if the, the disc was rough cut and then essentially spun to create the round um, shape, you would have needed a hole in the center to hold the disc in place as it was spinning. Uh, and so this may help to explain um, why the discs were made and also why there's so many of them. I mean, if, if you think of it that way, in terms of kind of material determination, a, a round disc with a hole in the center, a circular hole in the center is about the easiest shape you can make using the techniques that were available to the ancient craftsmen. And I think that may help explain why it was such a popular form and there's so many of them that were made. Um, because so many of these discs were made, there have been thoughts that um, they were in fact a medium of exchange, a kind of currency in Stone Age times. Um, and parallels have been found in um, the South Pacific, of course, with um, those massive stone disks that are found um, on South Pacific islands. Um, but I, I think there's no evidence yet 
to, to make me feel strongly that that's what's going on. Um, there's certainly, um, they must have represented great social value. Um, whether that was convertible into some other kind of exchange value, it's, I think it's too early to say. Great, thank you very much. <laughs>